right now on Morning News Now. On the clock, former President Donald Trump and 18 of his allies have just over a week to turn themselves into officials in Fulton County, Georgia. The former president is accused of leading a criminal enterprise to overturn his 2020 loss in the state. This morning, we're digging into what that surrender could look like, the charges they're facing, and the new pushback from Georgia's top Republican official on false fraud claims. Also, fire fallout this morning calls for answers are growing as we're getting an up-close look at the devastation from those deadly Maui fires. How the community is rallying together for support as the death toll continues to rise. Plus, changing channels with traditional television on the decline. Streaming services are surging. But is it really the end for TV? We're breaking down a new report that's marking a major milestone in the American living room and revealing the surprising shows that are coming out on top. And take a bow. Get ready to vogue. The material girl herself, Madonna, is returning to the stage. From the big stops up ahead on her tour to the health scare that forced her to postpone it, we have everything you need to know about the highly anticipated comeback. The good news is that she will be making stops in American cities. It's just going to come after the international part of the tour. Exactly. And the really great news that she's doing much better, obviously, exactly. getting back on the road. So. Getting the road again. Good morning. Good to see you. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks very much for joining us. We begin our show with that unprecedented fourth indictment facing former President Donald Trump over an alleged attempt to overturn the 2020 election result in the state of Georgia. Trump is among 19 defendants charged with racketeering and conspiracy. They all have until next Friday. That's nine days from now to surrender voluntarily or face arrest. This morning, we're learning new details about what that process could look like. It all comes as Trump says he will present a, quote, irrefutable report of alleged election fraud in Georgia next Monday without providing any evidence of what that could include. NBC News spoke with voters in Georgia about the latest charges handed down to the former president. I think it's about time that he was indicted for that. He's been investigating that a long time, and it's uh, finally come to fruition. So I think it's, uh, it's something that needed to be done, and he needs to go to trial. I don't think he belongs in jail because he's a former president. He has 74 million supporters. So I don't think he belongs in jail. I think it would be too divisive in this country. I think Giuliani and all, of, all his cohorts belong in jail. MSNBC anchor Katie Fang joins us now from Atlanta. So, Katie, the countdown is on to next week's deadline to surrender. We understand Fulton County's Sheriff's Office has provided some new details about what that process could look like. It's different from the previous three indictments we've seen. So tell us more about what we could expect there. Yeah, Joe, so we got some guidance yesterday from the sheriff's office indicating that all 19 defendants, and let me be clear, there's no carve out for a former president in this guidance, that they're all going to be turning themselves in to the Rice Street Jail. That's a couple of blocks away from where we are at the Fulton County Courthouse. Now, why is that important? Well, normally there's a two-step process. You turn yourself in, you post a bond, and then you eventually have an arraignment. That should still happen in this instance, but of course, being that we have a former president of the United States involved here with Secret Service, there might be some difference in how that goes down. But right now, the jail is also open 24-7. They don't keep bankers hours. And so there could be people turning themselves in as early as today with little to no fanfare that we actually would expect with somebody like former President Trump. Katie, the former president is still digging his heels into these claims of alleged election fraud in Georgia. He's even planning a news conference on it next week. But tell us about the state's Republican governor, Brian Kemp. What's his response here? Yeah, so Brian Kemp is one of several Republicans that we all know about, like Brad Raffensperger and former Lieutenant Governor Jeff Duncan, who we know testified for hours in front of this Fulton County grand jury before that indictment was unsealed a couple of nights ago. Those are former Republicans or Republicans that actually stood the line and basically said to Donald Trump and everyone else, there was no election fraud in our state of Georgia. And so Brian Kemp taking a very markedly different position than Donald Trump. Donald Trump of course, promising the a total exoneration at Bedminster on Monday when he does have that press conference. But of course, a lot of people are also saying he also promised an infrastructure plan and everybody's waiting for that as well. And Katie, of course, Trump not the only one indicted here. 18 others were also indicted. What is some of the reaction we're hearing from some of those other people who were indicted? Specifically, two big names stand out. Trump's former chief mm -hmm. of staff, Mark Meadows, and his former lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. 
Yeah, so we are getting a legal response from Mark Meadows, the former chief of staff for Donald Trump. He is trying to remove his case from state court to federal court, but we're also hearing, of course, more vocally from somebody like Rudy Giuliani, and we actually have some sound from him if we want to take a listen to that now. This is a ridiculous application of the racketeering statute. There's probably no one that knows it better than I do, probably some that know it as well. I was the first one to use it in white collar cases. But in major cases like the Boski case and the Milken case, uh, this is not meant for election disputes. I mean, I, this is ridiculous what she's doing. Problem for Rudy Giuliani right now, though, is he's actually admitted in civil litigation that was brought by Ms. Freeman and Ms. Moss. Ruby Freeman and Shay Moss that sued him for defamation. As you know, he accused them of fraud during the 2020 election, uh, excuse me, the election process. He's actually admitted that he knows that it was a lie, what he said about them. So I don't know how he plans on, you know, reconciling, taking this position he's saying now, which Rico doesn't apply to him, and the fact that he's admitted that he knew that everything he said about the election fraud was a lie. And so we'll have to see what that happens in an actual court of law, not in a court of public opinion. But you can expect more and more statements coming out from more of these defendants. All right, Katie Fang. Katie, thank you so much. Well, among the more serious charges former President Donald Trump is facing is violating the Georgia RICO Act, as you were just hearing about. NBC News now anchor Holly Jackson, though, is going to break down what RICO charges are and how Georgia prosecutors are using the statute against Trump. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. What does the Godfather have to do with the newest charges against former President Trump? I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. It's all about RICO, the law Mr. Trump's accused of breaking. That's the Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, a federal law that nearly three dozen states copied to combat a specific kind of crime. Are you in the mafia? Am I in the what? Yes, organized crime. Back in the 60s, the Senate held hearing after hearing on what had become a serious problem, the mafia's corrupt influence. You sat next to him, then what happened? Well, he had the knife and a gun on the table. The hearings, so dramatic, they're said to have inspired Mario Puzo to create the Corleones, the fictional family at the center of Francis Ford Coppola's Godfather movie. I'll handle it. I told you I can handle it. I'll handle it. It was around that time that Congress passed the RICO Act. It works like this. Instead of trying to bust a sprawling criminal group person by person and crime by crime, it lets prosecutors sweep multiple people into one bucket, basically. They then have to prove the people in that bucket are working for an enterprise to set up a racket or scheme, and that at least two underlying crimes were committed to further that scheme. Crimes that could include murder, bribery, fraud, extortion, and under this law, the boss is not immune. As we know from the prosecution of mob families, often it's a wink and a nod. But everyone understands what the boss wants and goes out and does that. And those can be crimes and they can be prosecuted. Ever since Richard Nixon signed the law in 1970, the feds have used it a lot, including in New York, which pioneered prosecutions under RICO in the 80s to break up the so-called five families of the city's mafia, later taking down mob boss John Gotti, the prosecutor who built his career by leading that charge, by the way, Rudy Giuliani, who now faces charges himself under the law. It's not just used for mobsters, though. Top executives at FIFA also faced RICO charges. So how does it apply to Donald Trump? This newest indictment accuses Mr. Trump and 18 of his allies of a criminal enterprise, a scheme to illegally change the outcome of the election he lost. Georgia prosecutors don't have to prove it's related to some formal group like the mafia, but they will have to prove that at least two underlying crimes were committed to help that scheme along. And in this indictment, they cite dozens of alleged crimes like witness intimidation, false statements, and forgery. Our thanks to Hallie Jackson for that explainer there. Well, now for more perspective on the case, let's bring in our NBC News legal analyst, Danny Savalas. Hi, Danny. Always great to have you. So as we just heard there on this, prosecutors have to prove that at least two underlying crimes were committed to further the defendant's scheme. Walk us through proving that. How difficult is that going to be? There are about 20 enumerated acts under the statute that qualify for those predicate crimes. Uh, but what makes this a little confusion is that these are overlapped with what are called overt acts, which are relevant to what's called a conspiracy. So for 
the RICO charges, you need the enterprise, which is alleged to be essentially, in this case, the campaign. The enterprise doesn't need to come to be a company. It certainly doesn't need to be the mafia. It can be any group working towards a common plan. Uh, but then when you get to the issue of the overt acts, conspiracy just requires an agreement to achieve some unlawful objective and an overt act. It doesn't need to be a crime. There you see there are several conspiracies charged. Uh, there are two counts, uh, another two counts I see there uh, towards the bottom. I mean, conspiracy is all over this indictment. And I would argue as much as RICO is very significant, so too is conspiracy because it just requires evidence of that agreement, which doesn't have to be a written agreement. Criminals do not write down their unlawful agreements on paper. It's by uh, inferred by conduct, uh, by behavior. Happens all the time in drug cases where there's not a written agreement. So you see that agreement, an overt act, doesn't need to be a crime. For RICO, you do need two predicate crimes, uh, but the Georgia statute is very permissive about what kinds of conduct can constitute those predicate crimes. So, Danny, I mean, racketeering is a pretty broad catch-all charge. We already know we've seen federal charges when it comes to election interference. So how likely is this, this state case in racketeering, likely to overlap with the federal charges? Does it ever make sense to roll them all together into a larger federal case? Uh, you cannot. Uh, you cannot roll a state uh, court case into a federal case because the federal government has no jurisdiction to prosecute local and state crimes. So while you'll see crimes alleged in the Georgia indictment that may sound similar to federal crimes alleged against Donald Trump, uh, they are different statutes and never the twain shall meet because uh, each sovereign jurisdiction cannot prosecute the other's crimes. And that's actually why there's no double jeopardy issues because these are considered separate sovereigns, literally separate kingdoms, and the kingdoms would be the federal government and the state government. And so that's why they can prosecute crimes that may sound and smell and feel very similar, but there's no double jeopardy issue. Sometimes the federal government uh, has a policy of refraining from prosecuting if they think the state crimes are adequate, but they're not bound by that procedure. And as a criminal defense attorney, uh, I think the defense bar would say they break that procedure all the time. So it really doesn't matter. Each can charge in their own court. Neither can charge the other's crimes. So, Danny, quickly on this point, moving it to a federal court is exactly what former Trump White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows is trying to do. Explain that to us. Is this just about geographic location? Why would he want that? And how likely is a judge to grant that request? Aha, uh -huh, you got me, Savannah, because that is a very rare exception where uh, really, you're not, it's not the federal government prosecuting these mm -hmm. crimes if you remove it to federal court. Removal, and I've removed many cases, all, although under a slightly different section, removal is basically like a castle move in chess. It's a uh, tactical move where a defendant can take a case and automatically send it up to federal court. It just gives the defendant a kind of home field advantage. Here are some uh, differences that may sound minor, but they're actually pretty significant. You're taking a prosecutor, a state prosecutor, out of the court that they know so well, that they're so familiar with, and putting them in an alien place, which is federal court. You're also going to draw, if you are a bunch of Republican defendants, you're always going to draw from a larger geographic area for your jury pool. That'll get you to the suburbs, and presumably that'll get you to more Trump voters. That could be the most significant strategic move. If this case stays in federal court, and I don't think it will, but if it did, that could make the difference between a win and a loss for these defendants. All right, Danny, thank you so much. Now let's get to the latest on the Hawaii wildfires as members of FEMA are getting a firsthand look at the damage. FEMA toured hard hit Lahaina yesterday. The wildfires have left at least 106 people dead across the state as victims have begun to be identified. Thousands were forced to evacuate and more than 2,700 structures have been destroyed. It's still unclear what sparked the wildfire. President Biden has promised the full support of the federal government in Hawaii's recovery efforts. I've spoken to Governor Josh Green multiple times and reassured him the state will have everything it needs from the federal government. It's painstaking work. It takes time. It's nerve-wracking. Most of the debris can't be removed until it's done. The president also says he and First Lady Jill Biden plan to travel to Hawaii, but no date has been set yet. Meanwhile, let's look at something a little more hopeful. Here's new video of the famed banyan tree in Lahaina getting watered by the Hawaii Department of Land and Natural Resources. Officials believe the tree will survive. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now from Maui with the very latest. Hi, Miguel. Good morning. So let's start with FEMA on the ground. Tell us more about their tour of the damage and the efforts by the federal government 
government to try and get people back on their feet, especially while it comes as we're seeing these reports of Hawaiians themselves setting up these sort of this type of resource uh, chains, rescuing other people. Tell us what's going on here with FEMA now. Well, Savannah, FEMA was took us down to the burn zone uh, late yesterday and gave us a tour of just how large the scale of their uh, search and rescue effort is. It is a Herculean task. They are searching block by block, building by building, home by home. They've only covered about 27 percent of the burn area. As you know, the death toll now stands at 106. That number is without question going to rise over the next couple of days. The question is, how high will it rise? FEMA says every day they are finding what appears to be bodies in the rubbish in the wreckage field and those those guys are working all day long with cadaver dogs to try to make hits on bodies there we're told that the wind speeds and the fire was moving at about 80 miles an hour when it blew through that area that's how quickly it incinerated everything in its path so the task there on the ground is going to take weeks to complete mm -hmm. they're actually hoping to have most of the search field done by the end of this week but identifying what are bodies and the remains of folks who lost their lives is going to take Take quite some time, Savannah. Miguel, I also want to ask you about these comments that Hawaii's governor, Josh Green, made. He gave an update yesterday on the wildfires where he clarified something he'd said about calling for a hold on sales of land to non residents. Tell us about that. Well, Savannah, there's been a lot of talk about this. Uh, many of the local residents who lost their homes and some folks who don't even know if they've lost their homes because they've not been allowed back into the burn zone say they've been getting call from real estate companies and realtors who are asking to buy their property before they've even been able to see it. Many have criticized that move as a land grab, saying the Hawaiian people are going to be pushed out by folks with deep pockets who want to rebuild this area and put luxury homes in the area. Here's what the governor said. Rebuilding will be for our local people. We'll work with the world, and we so appreciate the incredible generosity. That generosity demonstrates that most, 99.999% of everyone who has watched these telecasts and this crisis unfold, wants to support and love the people of Maui and Hawaii. But it's my job to look out for those who might take advantage. Savannah, obviously the rebuilding process is still months away. Uh, the cleanup here hasn't even been, they haven't even discussed that beginning here. Right. But they are taking they are taking all of these concerns very seriously, obviously. Miguel, before I let you go, I do also want to talk about these lawsuits filed against Hawaiian Electric in the wake of these wildfires. Explain to us what they're claiming against the utility company and any response we've heard. Well, as it stands right now, there are three class action lawsuits against Hawaiian Electric. Folks are claiming that the power company failed to actually shut off the power at the height of this fire, and that may have fueled this blaze if it didn't spark it. There's also been claims by some residents that downed power lines were sparking many of the brush fires. Mm -hmm. That is all, of course, under investigation. The FBI is on the ground. They are leading that investigation. There has been no official cause for the fire. That, too, could take weeks, if not months, Savannah. All right, Miguel, thank you very much. It was just over a week ago that flames descended on Maui, changing the course of the island's history forever. NBC News correspondent Noah Pransky takes a look back at how we got here, including some of the early warning signs. It could take months, maybe years of investigating to determine exact causes of the fire, mistakes that may have been made, and a timeline of events. But let's unpack the best reporting we have as of right now, because it paints a picture of chaos, despair, and some missed opportunities to save lives. This fire story starts with wind. And actually, we're going to zoom out to two days before Maui was aflame. The, the National Weather Service actually gave us the, the red um, flag warning ahead of time. Sunday, August 6th. That's when the National Weather Service issues a fire weather watch related to the powerful winds driven by Hurricane Dora off to the island south. The morning of Tuesday, August 8th, a series of small fires break out, including one about a mile and a half from the ocean. Those fires, according to officials, were 100% contained a few hours later. But the wind continued to whip trees, roof tiles, and power lines, many of which reportedly stayed energized. Okay, key moment here, 3.15 p.m. That's when the Lahaina fire grows so large, for the first time, it can be seen from space.
Oh my God, I think we need to load up the car maybe. The scene is still a mile away from the ocean, but the fire was moving fast thanks to those winds and acres upon acres of burnt out non-native grasses ahead of it. First responders, already stretched thin from the morning fires, struggled to keep up with the flames. And then I saw one Fred dead on, dead on the ground like a piece of charcoal. Like. But state officials said the 80 warning sirens around the island never sounded. And Maui Emergency Management didn't order the immediate evacuation of the crowded neighborhoods near Lahaina's downtown, even as fire and smoke started overwhelming neighborhoods. The evacuation order came finally at 5.50 p.m., but by that point, residents had already started taking fate into their own hands. Just seemed like every second was 10 hours waiting. But not everyone fled from the flames by car. Some resorted to the Pacific Ocean or swimming pools in the middle of the inferno. One that would burn for days, claiming homes, livelihoods, and lives. And also raise questions about how the deadliest natural disaster in the state's history might have been avoided. Noah Pransky, NBC News. Now to some tropical systems that could have an impact on Hawaii. That's right. Angie Lassman joins us now with the latest. Hey, Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We've got a couple of things that we're watching in parts of the eastern Pacific. We've got Tropical Storm Greg, which is sitting just to the south and east of the Hawaiian island chain. And we've got a high to the north. Both of those not quite as strong or organized as, uh, they, as the um, Hurricane Dora was last week when all of this unfolded. But still, that system and the high to the north are keeping it just a little breezier than normal. Those trade winds are elevated. Maybe 20, 25 mile per hour winds are expected across the islands at least through the next couple of days. By the time uh, we get into Friday, that'll come down and we'll start to see much quieter conditions, maybe some passing showers. But as we look ahead to the end of the weekend and maybe into early next week, we could add some additional tropical moisture as what is now Hurricane Fernanda starts to work a little farther to the west. It becomes a remnant low, but still could be bringing with it some additional moisture that, of course, would be good for uh, those that are still fighting some of those fires. We've also also got Invest 90E that is sitting just off the coast uh, of Mexico. That does have a pretty good chance of developing here over the short term. We're talking maybe a tropical depression in, over the next day or so, and it could eventually bring us some um, added moisture for folks in the southwestern desert parts of the of the country, as well as Southern California. So we'll wait and see exactly how this unfolds as we get into the end of the weekend and into early next week. But we could be talking about some some rain for in the forecast for folks there. Meanwhile, we've got some scattered showers across that same region. We've got some showers draped across parts of the Northeast in New England. We woke up to some soggy conditions along the I-95 corridor. And we've also got some scattered showers and a few thunderstorms left over along parts of the Southeast. And that is where we will find kind of the unsettled weather today along with the Midwest. This is that cold front that pushed through and brought us some um, unsettled weather yesterday. But today we're going to keep the scattered showers across that same kind of area as that front slowly but surely works away. And we also have some thunderstorms that could develop right along that system as we go into the afternoon hours tonight or today and into tonight. Meanwhile, as we get into tomorrow, that'll start to move a little farther to the east, that cold front, and bring us some um, Great Lakes showers and thunderstorms. Here's the area, though, that I want you to be aware of today. Five million people at risk. With wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour, it's a small area, but it does include um, some major cities. You can see Minneapolis included in that and Duluth. And this is, again, the timing of late afternoon into the evening hours. As we get into tomorrow, the severe threat not as great, but it does include places like Indianapolis to Detroit and up into the northern portions of the lower peninsula of Michigan. Same kind of um, same kind of threat. So winds, hail, tornado threat is low, so that's good. One other additional thing with this uh, is that we'll see some added rainfall and we could be dealing with some flooding concerns across the state of Florida, places like Savannah, Charleston, up into the mid-Atlantic could see some significant rainfall. And then um, from Burlington to Detroit and through Minneapolis in Duluth, we could see some uh, maybe quarter of an inch to 50 or to half an inch of <laughs> rain here. Not 50 inches. 50 so inch don't hail. worry. Don't worry. No, 50, <laughs> 50 inches, inches of rain. Of rain. Uh, but it could be a little soggy at times for folks there in the next couple of days. All right. Thanks, Angie. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Coming up, stranded at sea, a two hour surfing trip turned into a dramatic days long search. The all out effort to track down the tourists and the daring decision by one of the men to paddle for help. But first, the mother of a six-year-old student who shot his teacher appeared in court, what she pleaded guilty to, and the new details we're learning about the case. That's next.
We're back now with new developments in the shocking case of the six-year-old student who shot his teacher in Virginia. The boy's mother has now pleaded guilty to child neglect. Here's NBC News correspondent Kathy Park. The legal fallout deepening for the mother of a Virginia boy who shot and seriously injured his first grade teacher. Deja Taylor pleaded guilty to felony child neglect, which could carry a prison sentence of up to five years. Does she still feel responsible for what's happened? Oh, yes, yeah, she feels she feels very responsible, feels very bad. Taylor already pleaded guilty in federal court in June to using marijuana while possessing a firearm. Prosecutors shared new details about the moments after the six-year-old shot Abby's Warner at Richneck Elementary, saying he shouted, F you, I shot my teacher, before breaking free and punching a staff member in the face, and later saying he sold the gun from his mom because I needed to shoot my teacher. His teacher is still recovering from injuries to her hand and chest. So I have a scar up here and I still have um, some bullet fragments up here. She spoke to Savannah Guthrie earlier this year. I remember him pointing the gun at me. I remember the look on his face. I remember the gun going off. Zwerner has filed a $40 million lawsuit against the school district. Her attorney writing in part, our focus remains on justice for Abby and holding the school system accountable for failing to act on warnings a boy had a gun. Newport News Public Schools said in a statement that it cannot comment on legal actions. According to the family attorney, the boy still has regular contact with his mother, but he's currently in the custody of his great grandfather. We've also learned that the child is in therapy and improving every day. Back to you. All right, Kathy, thank you so much. Turning now to some international headlines, starting with new information about the whereabouts of the U.S. soldier who ran into North Korea last month. Josh Letterman joins us now from London with that and more. Hi, Josh, good morning. Hey guys, good morning. That's right. North Korea says Travis King admitted to illegally entering their country and that he says he did it because he was upset over inhumane treatment and racial discrimination in the U.S. military where he was facing disciplinary action. Now, North Korea says King wanted refuge in either North Korea or a third country. The U.S. military says they cannot confirm any of that, but they are working every angle possible to bring him home. Now to Niger, where the military junta that took over the country now says it is open to talks to resolve the crisis. That comes as both the U.S. and Russia are calling for a peaceful resolution to the coup. But the junta's military leaders are still refusing to reinstate President Mohamed Bazoum, who is under house arrest in what we hear are dire conditions. And they have refused earlier foreign efforts to mediate. And finally to Peru, where a new species of snake has an unlikely namesake. It's called Tachymenoides Harrison 40, in honor of, you guessed it, Harrison Ford, the actor behind Indiana Jones, who, if you recall, is not a huge fan of snakes. Now, unlike the character, the actor Harrison Ford says he actually likes snakes, and this one was named after him to honor his legacy of environmental advocacy. I'll send it back to you. Harrison Forty. All right. Very cool. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> I like Appreciate that. it. Yeah, it's very cool. All right. Well, now to a miracle at sea. Four Australian tourists and two Indonesian crew members are safe this morning after going missing at sea over the weekend. Here's NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald with more. We got everyone. A miracle at sea for a group of friends stranded in open water. For more than 38 hours, four Australians and two boat crew members clinging to surfboards off the coast of Indonesia. It was supposed to be a two-hour trip. On Sunday afternoon, a group of 17 people set off from North Nias in two boats headed for a surf resort on Penang Island. Treacherous weather caused the boats to lose contact, one making it to shore, the other disappearing in the storm. Setting off a frantic search and rescue mission by crews from both Australia and Indonesia. We just had to hang on to, to that hope, but then you think, God, what if they're unconscious or floating or... And they were gone a long time. And your hope starts to dwindle after a long time. 30-year-old Elliot Foote made the decision to paddle for help. He was rescued by fishermen over 20 miles away. Not long after, rescue crews spotted his friends. It was a coordination between all parties involved to be able to bring them back safely, but mainly the, their own mates. Their own mates bonded together. The news making its way to Australia. Yeah. We're lucky. It's <clears throat> so lucky. It's good news for all of them. That's right. The whole Everyone's been found, so that's, yep. that's the best news. Elliot's dad learning his son was alive by a text message. Hey, Dad. Elliot here. I'm alive. 
Safe now. Love you. Chat later. Despite the happy ending for some, one Indonesian crew member still remains missing at sea. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News. Just incredible. Well, coming up, cutting the cord. More American families are ditching cable and joining streaming services. But is it the end for traditional TV? We will go one on one with an expert to find out. Plus, new research on why cardio could be good for more than just your heart. Your medical checkup is next. now with our weekly medical checkup, including a new study that links heart attack pain with a survivor's lifespan. Plus, research shows that cardio could be good for more than the heart. We're taking a closer look at how it could also reduce the risk for cancer. Yeah, pretty incredible. Our friend NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Kavita Patel, joins us now for more on all these headlines. Hi, Dr. Patel. Great to have you with us. So let's start with this new research from the American Heart Association. It suggests that long-lasting pain after a heart attack may help predict how long you will live. What do we need to know here? Yeah, Savannah, our first study is out of Sweden. They looked at over 20,000 people that had had a heart attack and were younger than the age of 75. And they found that a shocking number, 45% of them had chest pain or pain similar to chest pain a year after their heart attack. We often think of chest pain as a symptom of a heart attack. We don't think about it as a risk factor in and of itself of some sort of problem, especially a year or later. And those with moderate pain were 35% more likely than those with no pain die from any cause, not just heart attack, but any So doctors work here, simple. Know your pain and no need to hide it. Talk to your doctor, talk to anyone about it, even if it's been years after your heart attack. All right, so heart health, we know getting to the gym is good. Here's some extra yeah. motivation to get to the gym. Doing cardio workouts, running, cycling, swimming, for example, in your 20s, that may cut your risk of cancer later. So what types of cancer are we talking about here? Yeah, Joe, I want to caution any study that shows some cases where it has a lower risk of cancer or a lower hazard ratio or association with cancer. And then this study, about a million men in Sweden, they were followed over 50 years because of the way folks that are enlisted in the military have to kind of report mm. their symptoms and physical activity with the country. So a million people in Sweden followed over 50 years, men only, and they found that those who had early kind of aerobic fitness, swimming, running, any of the things that we just talked about, actually had a lower hazard ratio or a lower association of certain cancers. They, those cancers were GI specific, so think colon, think um, bowel, kind of bladder cancers. There was an, also an increased kind of association of certain cancers like prostate and skin. But here are where there are some clear doctor's orders. Never too late or too early to start any kind of exercise, especially cardio fitness. And be careful, especially in some of those areas where you have really hot months mm. to do this cardio activity indoors, especially now much around parts of the United States. Oh, yes. I was in 106 degree Houston yesterday. No way <laughs> is it safe to be doing that outside. No way. There. So that's really important with it so hot across the country. Um, let's take the flip side of this just in terms of what could be tough sometimes about working out or risky for some people like people with asthma. But new research suggests that right. certain exercises could actually help improve breathing. Does that mean it could actually make a difference in your asthma longer term? And what exercises are we talking about? Yeah, it can. So this is a great study of studies. I love these studies. They looked at hundreds of studies and then culled down to about 28 studies of people with asthma, specifically to look at techniques of what we call respiratory training. You may be used to seeing in people who are in the hospital that have lung problems, they breathe into these machines and we tell them to hold their breath a little bit and they're trying to expand their lungs, especially after they get a lung infection, even like COVID. But with people with asthma, these 28 studies found that if you did about three types of respiratory training, so aerobic training, respiratory training, just like I described with kind of that machine, and then yoga breathing, that you could actually improve your asthma. So here's where it gets real easy and we can all practice this. You can do some deep belly breaths through your nose. These are the doctor's orders. So do a yoga breath where you take in a deep breath and try to count, try to count to at least five and hold it a little bit and then an active exhale. Check your air quality here too, because that can matter. But even when you need to, just that one deep breath several times a day can help with asthma. We, neither of us were on camera, Dr. Patel, but I was holding my breath along with you. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Dr. Patel, always great to have you. Thank you so much. Great information today.
This morning, we're putting the spotlight on Maui's first responders. Those heroes are being recognized by other firefighters from across the country who are sending their support, both financial and emotional. Those firefighters are still showing up to work despite suffering losses of their own. News Now anchor Tom Yamas has more. As Maui firefighters continue to work around the clock to put out hot spots and flare-ups, support and recognition for their actions is pouring in. I want to thank everybody for the calls, the texts, the emails, uh, just nonstop for the last few days. Uh, everybody wanting to help, and I cannot thank everybody enough. That wave of support comes with the understanding of just how overwhelmed first responders felt that first deadly day. These split-second decisions now weighing on firefighters with deep ties to this community. Um, I moved back specifically to help the community, and I feel just like I wish we could have done more, and everybody feels that way. Many who put their lives on the line to save others now personally impacted. 17 of the 18 firefighters in Lahaina have lost their homes. And while they're fighting fire and fighting for their own lives and fighting to protect people that they don't know, putting their lives on the line, in the back of their head, they know that their house has been destroyed and they're wondering about their loved ones. The International Association of Firefighters is answering the call to support these first responders, providing both financial and emotional aid. There have been some horrific conditions that our members have, have experienced, and they're going to continue to experience with some of the body recovery uh, that they continue to do. Sharing this message of pride with those still on the front lines. The overwhelmed firefighters, the IFF members out here in Maui, did an incredible job and saved so much in part of that community. And the whole world's watching, and we're so proud of our firefighters here. It's not just the physical damage, of course, leaving its mark on the island. The economic toll of these fires is also devastating. The estimated cost to rebuild right now falls somewhere between 3 and $7 billion. The typically picturesque state of Hawaii is losing more than a $1 billion in tourist revenue every day since the fires started. Coming up, could the office be the past... Could the office of the past be the home of the future? <laughs> Up next, we'll show you how developers are repurposing all those empty buildings. Stay with us. Welcome back. The COVID pandemic pushed more employees to work from home, of course, leaving companies to downsize their offices or in some cases move out of buildings entirely. Well, cities are now dealing with a record number of vacant spaces as apartment prices skyrocket. NBC News reporter Brian Chung takes a closer look at how some developers are getting creative. From these floors in downtown Kansas City, AMC's leaders used to call shots in their battle for movie theater dominance. But the company moved out of the historic building in 2013. And now the meeting rooms and executive suites are becoming living rooms and en suites. This could be the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I could be making dinner right uh -huh. here. Mm -hmm. There are 21 floors in this building. Seven have already been converted into over 100 apartment units. Developer Price Brothers plans on converting the remaining floors into another 280. What has been the big challenge for converting a building like this? That's historic. I think needing to preserve the integrity of the building, finding floor plans that fit within the space. Residents say they like the novelty of living in an old office space. You walk into these buildings and it's beautiful because they were for executives and executive suites. It's one answer to the rising problem of empty offices, fueled in part by work from home trends. Real estate firm CBRE says 18% of office space now sits empty, a 30-year high. Cities like San Francisco, Denver, and Atlanta dealing with vacancy rates well above that. Developers are getting creative to fill the space. Old offices turned into classrooms and biotech labs. Nobody wants to have a city backdrop that has unoccupied buildings that are decrepit and generally not attractive for their city. And so this is somewhat of a watershed moment to make sure that our cities can reinvent themselves. Reinventing isn't easy. Zoning laws and the cost of conversion are already obstacles. One study estimates only 15 percent of office buildings are convertible. Back in Kansas City at Sky on Main, the uniform shape of the building allows for a copy and paste approach. Every one of the floors that we're doing here is, is just exact same layout all the way up. The finished unit's an example of what could be when the conditions are just right. 
Do you expect to see more buildings downtown make conversions like this one? I do expect that. Why? Well, once they've seen that we've been successful. Even though this office isn't a house, proof that it can become a home. Brian Chung, NBC News, Kansas City, Missouri. Some financial headlines now, starting with the new estimated cost of rebuilding Maui after the deadliest wildfires in modern U.S. history. Yeah, we just heard a little bit about this. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with more and some other headlines. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning. Yeah, so a new estimate predicts the wildfires on the Hawaiian island of Maui will cost insurers $3.2 billion. According to the model from Karen Clark and Company, 2,200 buildings were damaged or destroyed within the fire perimeter. Most of those residential now. It found another 3,000 suffered secondary impacts from things like smoke. The death toll from the fire has now topped 100. More evidence is coming out to suggest the demise of traditional TV. New numbers from Nielsen show broadcast and pay TV fell below 50 percent in July for the first time ever. While streaming numbers are picking up, subscriber growth from those platforms has also slowed, leaving operators fighting to, f to bring in profits. And iPhone users will no longer have to retrain their fingers. Apple moved the end call button back to the middle of the screen in its latest developer version of iOS 17. As CNBC reported last week, previous beta versions moved the crucial red button to the lower right-hand corner of the screen from its long-standing position in the center. However, this isn't the final version of the new iOS 17, so it could always be changed again, guys. <laughs> Imagine a lot of people like thinking they hung up on someone, yes, they didn't exactly. hang up on them, nope. and nope. all the drama that would <laughs> Seems like that could cause some issues. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Thanks, Simone. Appreciate it. You got it. Thanks. Coming back, coming up, back into the groove. Madonna returns to the stage after a health scare. Up next, what fans of the material girl should watch for as the queen of pop returns to the spotlight. Stick with us. Welcome back. If you are one of those people who disapproves of booze at lunch, I don't know who those people are. Well, how about booze that tastes like brunch? The waffle company Ego has released Ew. brunch in a jar liquor. They say it, quote, seamlessly blends the flavors of toasted Ego waffles, sweet maple syrup, and rich butter with a hint of smoky bacon. It contains 20% <laughs> alcohol. This is Ego's second collaboration with Sugarland Distilling Company. The last one was a holiday drink, Ego Nog. This new drink is designed for parents who need some me time in the middle of running household errands. Get that day off to a good start. It's being released ahead of National Waffle Day next Thursday. We learned so much there. All right, how we're watching TV appears to be changing at a rapid pace. As traditional TV viewership declines, a new report from Nielsen shows streaming services accounted for nearly 30% of TV usage in July. That is a record high. Here to help us break it all down is Brian Stelter. He is the author of Hoax and Network of Lies. Brian, good to have you with us this morning. Let's jump right in. For the first time in history, broadcast and cable viewership dropped below 50% of total TV usage in the U.S. That sounds like a big moment, but, but have reports of the death of TV been greatly exaggerated? Where do things stand with linear TV moving forward and streaming right now? It all depends on what we mean by television. You know, 15 years ago, television meant whatever you get through your cable or broadcast connection, and that was it. But now television has half a, diff a dozen different meanings, and increasingly when we say television, what we really mean is streaming. So that's why this Nielsen data is a tipping point moment for America and for Hollywood. It shows that streaming is taking over slowly but surely, taking up more and more viewing time. And as you see on that chart, broadcasting cable getting less and less. Now, of course, some of the most popular shows that people stream do originally come from broadcasting cable. But this shows the, the, the greatest trend of our adult lifetimes, which is this move away, at least in Hollywood, of course, which is this move away from uh, scheduled, uh, only on the network schedule, to a world where everything's on demand. And frankly, that's a good thing for consumers. It's a big win for consumers. And, uh, and now we've reached that tipping point where it's the norm now. There are some potential hurdles for streaming we've been seeing lately. Prices are going up for streaming services. We've seen platforms like Netflix, now maybe Disney, cracking down on password sharing. How could these things impact some of these record-breaking numbers as we head into the fall? 
Right. Well, streaming has been a better deal for, for consumers than it has been for the companies making the content. That's why you see these price hikes happening right now, because the likes of Disney and, and, uh, and HBO and Max, uh, owned by Warner Bros. Discovery, are trying to make more money off these streaming products. Because quite frankly, they say they're losing money in the streaming wars uh, because they're busy making so much content. It's like the TV behind me. It's always on. There's always something new to watch. There's actually been a glut of programming, arguably too much new material out there. The writer's strike and the actor's strike has actually uh, kind of changed this momentarily. You're going to see a little bit less programming in the months to come because of these strikes. But overall, streaming's been a better deal for consumers than it's been for investors uh, because they've been spending so much, some of spending so much on new content. And ironically, what this Nielsen report shows some of the most popular shows and movies out there are the oldies, the, the oldie but goodies, you know. Uh, Suits, the, the, the old cable drama, has become the biggest hit on Netflix this summer. Uh, so, you know, I guess everything old is new again. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess, the big, most surprising thing. We wonder about this need for new com content. You mentioned Suits doing incredibly well. The kids show Bluey. They were the most streamed titles in July, racking up, get this, 23 billion viewing minutes combined. What does this say about what we do want to watch? <laughs> well, Bluey, I mean, Bluey's in a league of its own. And if, <laughs> if you've got young children like me, you know that Bluey is addictive. Uh, and, and you can watch those episodes 100 times over. Uh, so so that, you know, that's an amazing show in a league of its own. I, I think when it comes to shows like Suits, uh, or for example, I've been binge watching The Office on Peacock for the last couple of months. And, you know, for me... It's, I almost didn't remember the show. It's been almost a mm. decade since I last watched The Office. So it's like a brand new show to me. And I think that's why some of these older series, like for example, NCIS, the old CBS drama, still on the air, but old episodes of NCIS are also really popular on streaming. Suits, really popular on streaming. Uh, it's because in some ways, you know, these classics, there's a reason why they were so popular a decade ago. There's a reason why they become popular again today. All right. Brian Stelter, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Good to see you. Well, the queen of pop is returning to the stage. Madonna has released the new celebration tour dates after suffering from a severe bacterial infection over the summer. The health scare forced Madonna to press pause, delaying the start of her 80 show lineup. The tour will spotlight some of her biggest hits over the last 40 years and, of course, her huge legacy mm. in the music world. Entertainment journalist and pop culture expert Brian Balthazar joins us now. For more on Madonna's comeback, Brian, good morning. So what are we learning about these new tour dates for Madonna? Are there any any cities that are going to get cut out this time around, or is she going to hit them all? Right. Okay, so we're going to now be seeing Madonna start this tour with her international dates on October 14th, beginning in London. That was supposed to be the second phase of this tour, but now she'll start that in London, tour Europe, and return back to New York on December 13th. But because of scheduling conflicts, a number of dates uh, have been canceled, and then some actually have had some venue changes. So there are dates in Tulsa, Nashville, San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Phoenix. All of those cities have had a date that would be canceled. And then in the case of New York and L.A., uh, um, one in case of New York, it's going from Madison Square Garden one night to Brooklyn. So some of those ticket buyers will have to basically rebuy their ticket with a special link at Ticketmaster. So there are some sh shifts, but she's tried to honor most of the dates on her tour with a few of these exceptions here. So, Brian, obviously this is exciting for fans that these dates are back, and it's Madonna, a woman whose career spans over four decades. Just how important is this for her after these recent health challenges that we referenced for her to get back out there? Right. Well, you know, I think it's obviously important. She wants to establish herself again as the queen of pop. And not that she ever lost that title, depending on who, who honors that. But her fans have been crying out for it. And I think it's important. By the way, today's her 65th birthday. And she said she wants to reinvent uh, the pop concert. And who could better to do it than Madonna? Of course, it's important, but it's also important for her to monitor her health. But we've seen lots of artists do very well in, in, uh, in their 60s. We've seen Mick Jagger strut the stage. I don't see any reason why Madonna can't do it as well. Mm -hmm. Brian, we've decided you are now the Absolutely. arbiter of who gets to be the queen of pop, so it's totally up yeah. to you. The ball's in your court. Re sense. Real quick, what, <laughs> we have about a minute here, but what do we know about her illness? Has she or her team provided any updates on that and, and what she plans to do monitoring her health during this tour? 
Well, they've never been really specific. A bacterial infection can be many, many things, but one that takes you into ICU is pretty serious. It could have been bacterial meningitis or um, even uh, something, obviously something very serious. Uh, and so sepsis was the one that some doctors had speculated. She is, typically does have a physician on hand to monitor her physical health just because of the strenuousness of a concert like this. So obviously she's going to be monitoring us throughout the tour for health Brian. in general. Yeah, absolutely. Brian Balthazar, as always, thanks so much for coming by. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Good morning and thank you for joining us on this Wednesday. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, the growing fallout over former President Trump's historic fourth indictment in Georgia. The new details on what could happen once Trump and his 18 other co-defendants surrender to authorities. Also this morning, the death toll rises in Hawaii. 106 people have died in those widespread wildfires with just over a quarter of the burn zone now searched. We've got the very latest on federal search and rescue efforts. Plus the long-term health effects those fires could have on survivors. Shakedown, there are new developments surrounding the blind side adoption controversy that has America buzzing this week. The family of former NFL star Michael Orr now firing back against his shocking allegations. And Christmas in August, we might be in the dead of summer, but that is not stopping some retailers from getting in on the holiday action very, very early. I wow. knew when we talked about pumpkin spice last week that this story was just around the corner. <laughs> it is still totally summer. <laughs> it is. Just for the record. But get your Christmas shopping yeah. done now. All right. <laughs> we begin this hour with the latest on that indictment facing former President Donald Trump and 18 other co-defendants who've been charged in connection with attempts to try and overturn the 2020 election result in Georgia. Well, with next week's deadline to surrender to the authorities approaching, new details are emerging about what process could involve. At the same time, Trump is doubling down on claims of alleged election fraud in Georgia. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us from Atlanta with more on all this. Hey, Blaine, good morning. Well, Savannah and Joe, good morning to you both. That's right. The former president has until next Friday at noon to surrender here in Fulton County. Now, the Secret Service tells NBC News that's expected to happen sometime next week, though plans have not been finalized. And meanwhile, this morning, we're learning more about where he and the other 18 defendants could turn themselves in. With the countdown officially on for former President Donald Trump and his 18 co-defendants to surrender in Georgia, this morning we're getting new details of how that process could play out. In a statement, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office says, based on guidance from the DA's office and presiding judge, it is expected that all 19 defendants will be booked at the Fulton County Jail, a process that would typically include fingerprints and mugshots, though it is not clear whether that would happen here. The indictment brings felony charges against Donald John Trump. The former president is facing 13 charges in a sprawling indictment, alleging he and his allies unlawfully conspired in a criminal enterprise through a number of acts in an effort to overturn President Biden's win in Georgia. In a social media post, Mr. Trump said he would hold a news conference Monday to present an irrefutable report on alleged election fraud in Georgia, though he has not detailed what's in that report. Georgia's Republican governor, Brian Kemp, who Trump had tried to pressure after the 2020 election to overturn the state's results, is preemptively shutting down Trump's claim. In a post of his own, Kemp writes, the 2020 election in Georgia was not stolen. Our elections in Georgia are secure, accessible and fair. Among the others named in the 41 count indictment, Trump's former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who Tuesday pushed to have his case moved to federal court. And Rudy Giuliani, who helped pioneer the use of RICO, an organized crime scheme charge to prosecute mobsters in New York. Now, along with the other defendants, he's fighting that very charge. This is a ridiculous application of the racketeering statute. There's probably no one that knows it better than I do. 
And guys, back here at the Fulton County Courthouse, we have seen heavy security for quite some time leading up to the indictment earlier this week. But a sign that security is starting to at least reopen. The street behind me is now passable to one lane of traffic. That's something that we hadn't seen in more than a week, guys. All right, Blaine, thank you so much. And now to get a better understanding of the case, let's bring in Glenn Kirshner. He is an MSNBC legal analyst and former federal prosecutor. Glenn, good to have you with us this morning. So these RICO laws can sometimes clear the way for prosecutors to include lots of details to give more of a narrative picture of the alleged crimes committed. Help us understand that and how you think that maybe could help prosecutors in this case. Yeah, really, the, the beauty of RICO laws from a prosecutor's perspective, and I would argue from the community's perspective, is it, it gives us the tools to bring the full picture, to bring the context to the jury's attention of precisely what was going on. So rather than just indict somebody for one discrete crime and fight the battle on, you know, that battleground, the jury gets the entire picture. And I can tell you, Joe, as somebody who's prosecuted large-scale RICO cases in the courts of Washington, D.C., when the judge reads the indictment to the jury at the beginning of the trial, with all of the caveats that this is not evidence, this is merely the vehicle that was used to bring these charges, and you cannot infer guilt. But when the jury hears for the first time, either through a full reading of the indictment or a summary of the indictment, the precise charges and what each defendant is alleged to have done, I'll tell you, it's a powerful moment and it sets the tone. Uh, as for the defendants, we just heard Blaine report on the request of one of those defendants, Mark Meadows, to move this to a federal court. Help us understand why he would want that and then just ultimately who decides if that happens and how likely do you think it is? Yeah, he probably wants it because he thinks he'll have a more friendly forum, perhaps a more friendly judge, perhaps a, a, a more friendly jury pool. I don't know that any of those things are true, but the federal law does allow for a federal officer or former federal officer, Mark Meadows was, to petition to have his case transferred or removed from state court. To federal court. Now, the law itself doesn't really set out the standard, but the Supreme Court has. They say, you know, Meadows will have to show that what he was doing was within the scope of his official duties as chief of staff. I've read Meadows' uh, petition for removal. He says, look, I was chief of staff to the president of the United States. Therefore, I made phone calls on his behalf. I set up meetings. I spoke with Georgia state election officials. But he sort of ignores the elephant in, in the room. And it's that, yes, a chief of staff can do all these things, but the grand jury has found probable cause that all of these things were part of a criminal conspiracy to overturn the results of the uh, 2020 presidential election in Georgia with no evidence supporting that, you know, that endeavor, which I think will ultimately be fatal to Mark Meadows' attempt to remove this to federal court, though it wouldn't surprise me if the judge set a brief evidentiary hearing before ruling on, you know, whether this case should really be transferred from state court to federal court. So big picture here, Glenn, we know part of Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis's plan is to bring all the defendants to trial at the same time. So first of all, if any part of it does move to federal court, could that prevent that from happening? And then let's talk about no matter what here, this six month timeline to try and get this to trial. How feasible, how realistic is that? I heard D.A. Willis say that. I think a six-month timeline is aspirational, though it may not be all that realistic. You're going to have 19 defendants, 19 defense teams representing those defendants. There will be so many potential scheduling conflicts. There will be so many motions filed that need to be litigated and resolved in advance of trial. I think six months is going to be a very tough deadline to stick to. With respect to, you know, the fact that some of these defendants may sort of fall out of the case one way or another, maybe one or two go to federal court, I suspect that several of them may end up wanting to now at least broach the subject of cooperation. Because what I can tell you is that before somebody is named uh, as, a, as a defendant on a major RICO indictment, the charges are kind of theoretical, but once they see their name, you know, in black and white on the wrong side of the V, state of Georgia versus the named defendants, it has a way of focusing the mind, focusing their attention. And often after prosecutors bring these massive conspiracy and RICO prosecutions, all of a, all of a sudden these defendants begin to reach out and say, you know what, 
We may have ruled out cooperation before our client was indicted, but now let's talk. I think 19 have been indicted. I think it's very unlikely that all 19 will end up going to trial. We talk about how massive this is, and some legal experts say that they think this Georgia case might just be too wide in scope, never mind the complex logistics of putting 19 people, including a former president, on trial. Many people thought when we look at the federal indictment against Trump for election interference that there was a strategy here. One defendant in this case only charged one person, and then there were those unindicted co-conspirators. This case here in Georgia, do you think it could be too big to succeed? You know, no case is too big to prosecute, but many cases may end up being too big to prosecute at one time in one courtroom. It's interesting to see the different tactical decisions. Jack Smith, one defendant, a limited number of charges. That case is built for speed and alacrity in, in federal court in Washington, D.C. Fawny Willis decided that her case will be built as a vehicle to comprehensively hold accountable everybody that the evidence showed participated in this RICO conspiracy to corruptly overturn the, the election's results in Georgia. I will say that some of these large RICO cases end up, as was the case for me, we had 13 charged defendants when everybody else pleaded guilty. We ended up having to do three trials. We went against six defendants in the first trial, six defendants in the second trial, one defendant in the third trial. It took a number of years to plow through, but we did it, and we did it successfully. So it wouldn't surprise me if this gets sort of broken up into smaller, more manageable criminal trials. All right. Glenn Kirshner, good to hear about your experiences to help us understand this a little better. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, we're beginning to learn more about the victims of those deadly Hawaii wildfires that have now claimed at least 106 lives. FEMA is on the ground touring the damage left behind by the fires, with 27 percent of the burn zone now having been searched by first responders. This comes as questions continue to grow about Hawaii's response to the emergency. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the latest from Maui. This morning, ground zero of the burn zone. For the first time, the federal government giving NBC News an up-close view of the destruction. As search and rescue, look for the missing. How would you describe the search area? How daunting is it? Well, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. This is apocalyptic. It's, it's terrible. At the peak of the fire, many were escaping the flames in vehicles. Now authorities have to go car by car and block by block to see if they can find anyone who didn't make it out alive. With more cadaver dogs on the way, officials expect to identify up to 20 new victims a day. 79-year-old Buddy Jantok and 74-year-old Robert Dykeman are the first to officially be identified. The governor says multiple children are also among the dead. We are heart sick that we've had such loss. For families like Clifford Abahai, the wait is agonizing. His 98-year-old grandmother, Louise, is still missing. I love you, Grandma. Uh, I hope you're at peace. We go slow, we go methodical, we're thorough, and then we're respectful. These are somebody's uh, family. From every direction and every angle, you can see the true scope of the damage. This is what authorities are sifting through every day. The fire came through here at 80 miles an hour. They need to search every building and every home before they can say their job here is complete. Though the cause of the fire is still under investigation, resident Shane True says he watched a downed power line ignite dry brush just outside his home. Flames start almost immediately after from the dry grass. At least three lawsuits have now been filed against Hawaiian Electric, alleging turning off the power lines would have saved lives. The utility company had no comment. Now, a week after the fire destroyed this beachfront haven, families are left waiting for answers from the ashes. Our thanks to Miguel Almaguer for that report. President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden are expected to tour Hawaii at some point, but it's unclear yet when that will take place. Well, now as the cleanup efforts continue in Hawaii, health experts are warning the fires could potentially pose long-term health risks. They say it's due to chemical compounds that are contaminating the air, water, and debris in the area. 
We're joined now by Dr. Jonathan Newman. He's an assistant professor of the Department of Medicine at NYU Langone Health. Dr. Newman, good morning. Thanks very much for being here with us. So walk us through what some of the things that we need to be aware of when it comes to these chemicals being released after a wildfire. What's happening here? Sure. So um, I think there's a couple of relevant issues. <clears throat> there's first things related to the burn itself, mm. um, um, the wildfire smoke, as you indicate, and the long term effects of some of the, uh, uh, let's say, chemicals that were in building materials um, within the area, uh, some of the burnt, let's say, um, um, ground materials and agriculture products. Um, a lot of those will need more time and surveillance for us to know some of the long-term health impacts. But we do know from lots of other studies and, and, and previous um, examinations of populations that exposure to things like lead or arsenic or asbestos have a number of adverse health effects, both in terms of, let's say, the function of your heart or the function of your lungs. So we'll need some time to know more, but certainly a lot of caution is warranted, particularly for some of the first responders and search crews that are theirs that are there now in terms of wearing personal protective equipment to reduce any types of exposures. Yeah, so doctor, for anyone who was in the area who was exposed to these fires, maybe who made these quick escapes that we've heard about, what should they be on the lookout for regarding symptoms of a potential illness, especially also if they're still in this area, as many people are? Um, so I think the first thing would be to categorize it for, for anyone who has any long-term um, health risks, let's say people that are of older age that have other medical problems like high blood pressure or, or uh, known heart disease, mm -hmm. um, to follow up early and, and often with your medical care providers if you're feeling unwell. I think a lot of the long-term effects um, are more subtle and, and need management and monitoring. And I think testing of water supplies and air quality and food supplies will certainly be warranted uh, by governmental officials to make sure that it's safe to consume drinking water or to use hot water. Um, a lot of the chemicals that were exposed through some of these burns can really have long-term exposure patterns that lead to long-term health effects. But if you're having trouble breathing, if you're having chest pain, if you're feeling acutely unwell, those are all immediate reasons to seek medical care and attention. And Dr. Newman, let's talk about even further out here, which is some of what you're discussing in terms of water contamination, things like that. But once the flames are finally extinguished, how long does the air in, in the burn zone, excuse me, remain a concern? What should health officials focus on after the fire is put out? Yeah, so um, at least the immediate effects, so the, the air quality itself um, can be monitored pretty easily. And once the, the burning of any of the combustible materials has stopped, um, a lot of those, those fine particulates related to the forest fires itself uh, drop off pretty dramatically. But what you end up dealing with over the long term is sort of the aerosolized dust and materials as part of the recovery efforts. And some of that can contaminate soil mm. and contaminate groundwater. So there needs to be a lot of monitoring going forward to make sure that um, a lot of the public resources and homes, as the environment is, is rebuilt and reconstructed and rescued, is safe for uh, usual life and, and use of public services. Um, a lot of those effects will take time to know and time to uh, to study and understand. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think in terms of recovery crews, there's obviously a lot of set protocols to protect those that are um, uh, continuing the further rescue efforts and continuing the salvage operations. Um, and then there needs to be additional attention for, let's say, some of the residual contamination that might exist long term. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jonathan Newman, one more thing to be watching out for on this long, long road of recovery and rebuilding. Thank you so much for joining us.
Finally, summer relief could be on the way for parts of the country dealing with these blazing temperatures. Angie Lastman is back in studio with us with the latest. Hey, Angie. Hey there, guys. It's important to say some parts of the country because not everybody's going to see the relief. And unfortunately for the South, we're not going to see much relief in the coming days. But the Pacific Northwest will see some improvements. We'll get back to normal. But let's talk about some of the streaks that the South has been dealing with. Uh, we're, we're talking 100 degree or higher days in a row. Austin, 39 in a row. That breaks the previous record, which was 27 days in a row. We've also got New Orleans, which now has a record six consecutive days of 100 plus temperatures. The previous record was three days, but that was set just a couple of weeks ago. And before that, it had been decades since they saw that many in a row. We're also talking about a really long stretch of, of more than 10, 11 days over the course of the year that they saw 100 plus temperatures. So it's been a really hot and uncomfortable kind of stretch of the summer for folks there. Houston, not quite at a record just yet, but they're just a, a couple of days shy of it, talking 17 consecutive days at 100, and the record right now stands at 24. They'll likely hit that. We've also got the heat alerts that I just mentioned in parts of the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Great Falls, Boise, Redding, Fresno, down through Phoenix, and of course, parts of Texas still dealing with these heat alerts as temperatures once again surge into the triple digits. Medford headed to 107 today. That could potentially tie a record. Portland is headed to 100 degrees. Not a record, but still uh, not what we should be feeling like here as we get through uh, mid the middle of August. Baker City heads to the triple digits in Boise 103. If you're looking ahead to tomorrow, we'll start to get a little bit of a break for folks there. We're still going to be in the 90s. We're still going to be warm in a lot of places, but it'll be a bit of an improvement. And then by the time Friday, Saturday rolls around, we'll get back to more typical kinds of temperatures for folks there. And of course, we've got to talk about the South. Most of the Mid-Atlantic, the Midwest, the Northeast is looking pretty good. We're actually below normal in some spots through the day today. Not the case for Houston. We're running above normal once again, and we're headed to 100 degrees. Baton Rouge hits 95 this afternoon, and stretching from Pensacola to Jacksonville, it'll be low 90s. We keep it comfortable across that same kind of region from Minneapolis to Cincinnati to Washington, D.C., kind of in a normal, typical range. That doesn't last for long, though. Look ahead to the weekend. We're going to see the middle of the country surge with temperatures. It's going to be an AC cranked up kind of weekend for folks there from Wichita through Saturday and Sunday. We'll hit the trip digits. We'll likely see more records across this area. You can see Minneapolis will be in the 90s. Guys, Jackson into the triple digits. 108 for Dallas on Sunday. So Oof. AC all the way up is definitely going to be oh, yeah. needed. I was in Houston yesterday. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Just walking for five seconds from the car to yeah. the door of places is really hot. Yeah. yeah. Angie, thank you very much. Of course. Coming up on Morning News Now, the family of the former NFL star at the center of the Oscar-winning film The Blind Side is firing back this morning against allegations that the entire adoption was a lie. We'll bring you their side of the story later in the hour. But first, the latest on that controversial police raid of a Kansas newspaper. The high-profile back and forth now unfolding between the paper's publisher and local authorities. That's next. We're back now with the latest on that police raid of a small newspaper in Kansas. Last week, officers from the Marion Police Department confiscated notes and equipment from the paper's newsroom and the publisher's home. Even though hard drives, computers, and documents were seized by authorities, the Marion County record is still expected to hit newsstands today. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the latest. Hey there, this morning the Marion County record is being published on schedule just as it always is every Wednesday. But getting the weekly paper out hasn't been easy after a police raid that some media lawyers are calling unconstitutional. This morning the weekly edition of the Marion County record is still being published. Even after police in this small Kansas town raided the paper's offices on Friday, seizing cell phones, hard drives and documents. The search warrant accused reporters of identity theft and computer crimes while reporting on local restaurant owner Carrie Newell for a story that didn't run. Newell told the city council the paper illegally obtained her driving record, which included a DUI. The publisher and co-owner of the paper, Eric Meyer, denies the allegation and tells NBC News he believes the police chief has a personal axe to grind. Police chief saw an opportunity to let's really stick it to this newspaper, which has not been entirely supportive of him. According to Meyer, the paper was investigating police chief Gideon Cody's time on the force in Kansas City, including that he was set to be demoted for misconduct before joining the department in Marion. Meyer says the sources wouldn't go on the record and the story was never published.
The police chief did not respond to NBC News's request for comment, but previously defended the raid, arguing there were legal grounds. It was her life. Donna Bernhardt worked at the record for 30 years alongside Joanne Meyer, the 98-year-old co-owner of the paper who passed away the day after the police raided the offices and her home. Did this seem heavy-handed? Yes, extremely heavy-handed. They didn't handle it correctly. Now, with media organizations, including NBC News, calling the raid a violation of the First Amendment, the Kansas Bureau of Investigation says it is taking over and will be the, quote, lead law enforcement agency investigating the incidents in Marion County, while residents are stunned and saddened to be in the national spotlight. It just hurts that Marion has to go through this, this negativity right now. In a letter to the police chief obtained by NBC News, the paper's attorney says the raid violated multiple constitutional amendments and is demanding the police department not review any of the information collected because it was, in his words, illegally seized. Overnight, the Kansas City Police Department confirming to NBC News that Gideon Cody worked there and that his employment records at the department are closed. Back to you. All right, Stephanie Goss, thank you so much. International headlines now. Russian drone attacks are targeting Ukraine's key ports and grain infrastructure. Josh Letterman joins us from London with that and more. Hey, Josh, good morning. Hey, good morning. The governor of Ukraine's Odessa region says Russian drones damaged warehouses and grain silos at a port on the Danube River. That is putting a further chill on Ukrainian efforts to export grain and other products through the Black Sea, where Russia has been blockading Ukraine's seaside ports since the war started. Moscow recently pulled out of a deal to let some ships through and isn't commenting on these latest strikes. Now to the Dominican Republic, where the death toll in a powerful explosion near the capital has risen to at least 10. Authorities are investigating what caused an explosion that ripped through a bakery on Monday afternoon and also injured more than 50 people. The Dominican president visited the site and says there are also 10 people that are missing. And finally, to Germany, where the government is set to loosen up on marijuana. Germany's cabinet is on track to approve a plan to eventually decriminalize small amounts of pot for recreational purposes and also to let people grow up to three of their own plants. Under this plan, Germans 18 and older could also join cannabis clubs that would grow marijuana for their members. Now, Germany's parliament still needs to sign off. So, guys, this whole thing could still all go up in smoke. All right, Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Coming up, new developments this morning surrounding that blindside adoption controversy. The family of former NFL star Michael Orr is now firing back against his shocking allegations. We've got the very latest after the break. We are back with a new twist in the controversy surrounding the family whose story inspired the 2009 hit film, The Blind Side. The family accused by former NFL player Michael Orr of tricking him into a conservatorship is now fighting back with shocking claims of their own. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung has the details. Hey there, Michael Orr says the people he considered parents cheated him out of millions and betrayed his trust. But the Tuies, they are now lawyered up and preparing for a fight in court. They say they're heartbroken. They call those allegations hurtful and absurd, while they also claim this isn't the first time or has tried to shake them down for money. The family at the center of the Oscar-winning film The Blind Side, now on defense. Do you have any place to stay tonight? Don't you dare lie to me. Come on. After former NFL player Michael Orr filed a lawsuit against them, claiming he was lied to and exploited for their financial gain. But the Tui family is flipping the script. In a statement to NBC News, their attorney alleges Orr previously threatened them in an attempted shakedown, saying he would plan a negative story about them in the press unless they paid him $15 million. In an interview Monday promoting his new book, Orr did not address the lawsuit, but expressed some frustration with how he was portrayed. When I moved in with the Tuies family, who uh, I'm grateful for, for letting me uh, stay my senior year there. But you have to understand, and I was an All-American football player before I moved in with them. Do you want to stay here, Michael? Just as the film depicts, or describes in new court documents, how he was on his own in high school and nearly penniless. He says in 2004, just before his senior year, the Tuies invited him to live with them, eventually discussing adoption. 
Orr claims he was tricked into signing documents he believed were a necessary step in the adoption process. But just six months ago, he says he learned he was never adopted. Instead, Sean and Leanne Tui became his conservators. In an interview with the Daily Memphian, Sean Tui said the conservatorship was a way to secure Orr's NCAA eligibility to play college football, saying lawyers advised, we couldn't adopt over the age of 18. The only thing we could do was to have a conservatorship. Orr claims the Tuies used their power as his conservators to give away the rights to his life story without him receiving any payment while they profited. Now he wants the money he believes he's owed. The family denies the accusations. How come we're not eating at one of your restaurants tonight? Well, because tonight is a special occasion. Sean Tui built and sold a successful restaurant empire. His attorney saying the notion that a couple worth hundreds of millions of dollars would connive to withhold a few thousand dollars in profit participation payments from anyone, let alone from someone they loved as a son, defies belief. And Michael Orr's attorney tells NBC News they believe that justice will be served in the courtroom and hope to get there quickly. The Tuies have said they will never oppose ending the conservatorship if that's what Orr wants, and they do hope to reconcile with him. But still, they will fight what they call an offensive lawsuit. Back to you. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much. Let's bring in civil rights attorney and former prosecutor Kristen Gibbons Fedden for more on this. Kristen, good morning. So, so as we heard Kaylee mention, the Tui family is pushing back against Michael Orr's lawsuit. When, when you have a he said, they said situation like this, how does it often unfold in court? How do we get to the truth? Well, it's interesting because, like you said, it really depends on how it comes out in court. Like the Tui family, they really came out swinging. And it's unsurprising, right? These allegations really strike at the heart of trust and family and are really contradictory of how the blind side had really painted them. And like in football, really, a good defense is going to be a strong offense. We're seeing that in the public arena, and we're going to have to see that in the courtroom as well. And it's going to be dictated by evidence and legal arguments. And I think one of the most critical things to really point out here is while the Tuies may genuinely believe that they really acted in Orr's best interest, it's essential to remember that good intentions do not always equate to a legal justification. So in court, they're going to have to come out a little bit stronger. So we've gotten used to talking about conservatorships because of the Britney Spears case over the last couple of years. Help us understand the conservatorship here, why he might have been under a conservatorship but not actually been adopted by the family, keeping in mind Michael says he thought he had been adopted by the family and the family saying, you know, we would try to adopt someone who is, who's 18 or older. I think that's actually going to be the crux of what is going on here to really unfold this really tangled web. You know, adoption and conservatorships are like apples and oranges. They really are two different legal theories and legal things. Adoption creates that permanent bond, you know, almost embedding someone in the family and traditionally when they are under the age of 18, which Orr says he was, so they could have adopted him. Whereas conservatorship, on the other hand, really, um, is when someone stands in the shoes as a guardian, it's typically a guardian or a parent, to manage a person's personal and financial affairs. And at that stage, where he was already an All-American football player, why would he need that? And I think that really is going to delve into the legal consequences with and potentially cause some issues with the NC. So lots of headlines coming out of this, but bottom line, it is about a lawsuit. This petition from Orr accuses the Tuies of a breach of their fiduciary duty as conservators. What is Orr asking for here? Orr is going to be asking for all, all of that profit, all of the revenue that was made through um, the blind side. Um, I think he's also going to be asking for any and all revenue they may have collected that we just don't know about. So any and all damages re related to the conservatorship that he was unaware of um, is really going to be what he's going to be asking for. But I think one thing that's really important is highlighted in the clip earlier, beyond those financial implications, if there's any evidence that the Orr family sidestepped those, those NCAA regulations to either maintain Orr's eligibility or even avoid potential recruitment violations, they both could be facing some type of penalties within that NCAA rule. All right, Kristen Gibbons-Fedden, thank you so much.
Now let's switch gears here and go to a growing crisis, straining emergency room doctors. Children visiting ERs for issues related to their mental health has skyrocketed with research showing visits increasing in kids ages 5 to 11 by 24 percent and rising 31 percent in ages 12 to 17. This was back between 2019 and 2020. Well, now this surge has emergency room doctors pleading for more support and calling for resources to help tackle the growing number of children with mental health concerns. NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards joins us now to discuss. Hey, Erica, great to see you. So walk us through what doctors are saying about the scope of this issue, how the mental health crisis has become so much worse for ER doctors in recent years. And also, just because I pointed out there that that particular study was from 2019 to 2020. Is this something we are still seeing? Can it be contributed to the pandemic? What do we know about right now? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. So um, this is a group of three influential um, doctors groups, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Emergency Medicine, the Emergency Nurses Association, all coming together to say this is unsustainable. They cannot handle the influx of kids coming into their emergency departments with mental health concerns. Right now, they say about a half million children are coming in every year with these concerns across the country. But to answer your question, this is ongoing and it's increasing in volume. I was talking with a psychiatrist at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego yesterday. She said that a few years ago, about 30 kids per month would come in with these kinds of issues. Now it's 30 a day. So so although wow. this started before the pandemic, the pandemic has absolutely contributed. Erica, this call comes at a time, this call for help, I should say, when we are seeing mental health issues surge among children and teenagers generally. This is not just what we're hearing directly from <clears throat> these doctors' offices, from hospitals, but also from teens themselves. A CDC study that surveyed kids found more than 40% of high school students are feeling sad, they're feeling hopeless, and that it's enough that they can't engage in regular activities for at least two weeks was sort of the benchmark there. It also saw increases of suicidal thoughts among kids nationwide as well as suicidal attempts. How have doctors been managing this? I mean, you mentioned that doctor that you spoke with in San Diego. I'm sure that's something we're seeing across the country. How are they handling this? How are they helping these adolescents with these issues when they are so strapped? Well, in their own words, it's not ideal. What happens is these kids come into their emergency departments. Um, they, the doctors can basically assess them for their risk. But then after that, these kids need specialized facilities. They need beds outside of the hospital, people trained to deal with this kind of thing. What happens is there aren't enough beds. So kids end up in regular hospital rooms in an inpatient room where they might be get, but they might get their medicines, you know, taken care of, but otherwise they're not getting the services that they need. When those beds fell up, they have to be boarded in the emergency rooms, along the hallways and in the waiting room, uh, sometimes for days, sometimes for weeks, Savannah. And Erica, what resources are doctors saying they need to help tackle the growing crisis to stop what you just described, kids in the hallways for weeks? First and foremost, they need mental health professionals, pediatric mental health professionals in the emergency departments with them. They're saying that they should also be added to various parts of the community, like in um, schools and, um, you know, at doctor's offices to try to help catch these kids before it becomes an emergency situation. They also need uh, more information on how to deal with some of these at-risk groups, you know, children with trauma, LGBTQ youth. And... Savannah, some of these kids are coming in with talking about suicide. They're as young as five years old. Savannah. Oh, Erica Edwards, just absolutely heartbreaking to hear, hard to wrap your mind around. Thank you very much. And if you or anyone you know is struggling, please call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Coming up, turns out it's never too early to start thinking about the holidays. That's right. Some retailers are already hauling out those Christmas-themed items in the middle of August. So why now? We've got the lowdown that may or may not get you in the holiday spirit. That is up next. Welcome back and happy holidays. <laughs> Last week we told you about an early dive into pumpkin spice season. Now, believe it or not, a few more holiday traditions are headed our way. If by happy holidays, you mean happy Labor Day. Uh, yeah, right. Or what's in August? I don't even know. It's in August. It, my yeah. birthday. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's right. Some retailers are already getting into the spirit by rolling out, get this, string lights and Christmas trees. Here's NBC News business and data reporter Brian Chung with the latest on all things Christmas in August. 
Hey there, with 131 days until Christmas, holiday spending is expected to grow this year, but despite inflation concerns. So even if it seems way too soon to talk about Santa, some stores are already saying tis the season in August. It's the most wonderful time of the year. But already? Sure enough, the Christmas spirit is alive and well, as some retailers are saying hello to holiday shopping, as Axios reported. Enjoy the festivities, you will. At Home Depot, holiday products launch online, including eight-foot Santas and giant nutcrackers. And Costco has already started rolling out its artificial Christmas trees on store floors. Are you kidding me? It's August 15th. One Costco shopper saying, slow your roll. Not everyone's thrilled. Too soon, some are saying. Even our own Rockefeller Center tree chiming in, saying, I even find it annoying. But according to Google, more than a quarter of Americans were already shopping for the holidays in July. Searches for Hanukkah gift ideas and Grinch Christmas tree decorations increased over 5,000% in the past month. And e-commerce platform Shopify says sales of ornaments last month were up over 25% compared to last year. Seasonal village sets and accessories up about 240%. What's going on? Retail experts say companies are taking notice to boost sales. At the end of the day, they want to meet the consumer. They want to meet the shopper where the shopper is. And if that means a discount in July, they're going to play that game. For now, the holidays are still taking a backseat to fall festivities sales, like Etsy with its pumpkin throw pillows and Target with autumn-themed wreaths and pet Halloween costumes. Experts advising that inventory might be tighter this year than last, so no shame in buying seasonal items early. For those of us that can make their list before they check it twice and get there early, take advantage because many of us who are going to be procrastinators may be left holding the bag. Because after all, maybe it's not too early to start spreading the holiday cheer, even before Labor Day. Home Depot says you can expect to see items in store in the next couple of weeks, and holiday sales events are on the horizon too. Amazon recently announced that its prime big deal days is slated for October. Back to you. All right, Brian Chung, thank you so much, and happy holidays, like I said. Putting up the tree, putting <laughs> yeah. it up this week. Right, more financial headlines now. Disney now being accused of withholding profits from one of Hollywood's largest movie finance financiers. Silvana Hanal joins us with that and other money news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Hey, Savannah. Hey, Joe. Good morning to you. Yeah, so a Hollywood financier involved in hits like Avatar, The Way of Water, and The Greatest Showman is suing Disney for breach of contract. TSG Entertainment, which has helped co-finance around 140 films produced by Disney's 20th Century Fox, claims the media giant withheld profits and cut sweetheart deals to boost its streaming platforms and stock price at the expense of its partners. TSG went on to say Disney's actions deprived it of cash needed to invest in individual films and its efforts to sell stakes in other movies. Disney has not responded to CNBC's requests for comment. Amazon is pledging to make it easier to find discounts for the life-saving drug insulin. With the change, patients will no longer have to search for and manually enter coupons for insulin from the three largest makers. Amazon says that by automatically applying the discounts, it could lower the cost of the drug to as little as $35 a month for the supply. And XPro, that's the service formerly known as TweetDeck, is now behind a paywall. X Corp is requiring the $84 a year blue subscription to gain access. And this isn't a surprise. X said last month it was planning to make this move. The service is popular among journalists, social media professionals, and others who need to schedule posts and view multiple timelines and lists at once, guys. All right. Thanks, Savannah. You got it. Well, there is a new way to find your soulmate online, maybe. It doesn't even involve typing. That's because Gen Z users on dating apps are using memes to flirt with potential love interests. NBC News reporter Maya Eaglin spoke to viewers of NBC Stay Tuned, our show on Snapchat, to hear about their experiences. There's a new trend on dating apps, and it involves some of the most popular memes. A recent study out by Hinge says sending memes is the number one way to flirt on the app. 74% of users do it. So we asked our Stay Tuned audience on Snapchat what they thought. 
What's going on? Stay tuned. My name is Ryan. I'm here to share a success story for a meme exchange. Really, it was just me that was exchanging them because she was not communicative. She never responded until finally, coincidentally, we met up on a film set that I was working on. Eventually, she's like, oh, I thought you looked familiar because I was like sending all these gifts. Like, was that you? Anyway, kind of a fun story, but we're in love. We've been dating for a year and a half, and uh, the rest is history. As someone who secured a boyfriend via sending memes back and forth, and we are still together eight years now, so that was a long time ago, but it works, especially if they're Rihanna. Right, babe? But it's not just about sending these funny photos and gifts. 60% of hinge shaders say it's important to get a feel for someone's meme humor before agreeing to go on a date. And 44% say they're more interested in someone after receiving a funny meme. And here's where things get interesting. Gen Z daters are 48% more likely than millennials to use memes to see if someone is a good match or not before going on a first date. For my boyfriend and I, memes is like the primary form of communication, and I do it with my siblings and my parents too. It's just humor, jokes in a different format. Just take it from Hinge's director of relationship science, who said, quote, our digital sense of humor has become a key part of our identity. There's a sense of, if you don't get my memes, you don't get me. Memes now not only helping people share a laugh, but maybe find a little love too. Maya Eaglin, NBC News. <laughs> All right, from the hearts to heartbreak coming up just moments ago, some heartbreak for the Women's World Cup host nation as England beat Australia in a nail-biter of a semifinal match. We've got all the highlights and a preview of the final match between England and Spain. Stick around. Good to have you back with us. Well, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has caused a stir in China after accidentally eating magic mushrooms. Yellen was spotted eating this traditional mushroom dish on her high stakes visit to the country last month. Well, Chinese social media picked up on it and the restaurant ended up selling out of the dish. Yellen called it delicious, telling CNN, I was not aware that these mushrooms had hallucinogenic properties. I learned that <laughs> later. <laughs> so... I guess we know what happened later. Exactly. Well, <laughs> hopefully she didn't make any important decisions in that period. This is why I don't eat mushrooms that night. I don't either. Like, I don't like mushrooms. So. <laughs> All right. Finally this hour, Australia's World Cup run has ended in heartbreak after the co-hosts were beaten 3-1 to one by England in the semifinals. Yeah, well, despite being spurred on by the home crowd, Australia couldn't overcome a ruthless England, who will now play in their first World Cup final against Spain on Sunday. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us from Sydney with more on that game where despite Team USA being out, I hope she's still living it up. Hey, Molly, good to see you. Walk us through the match. How did England get the win? Guys, good morning. This was not the story I dressed for. This is not the story <laughs> the Sydney Opera House was dressed for. We thought we were going to deliver a different headline for you. Uh, but look, England was absolutely the stronger team tonight. They are the defending European champions, the Lionesses. And I'll walk you through a little bit. Uh, really exciting first half. England ended that first half with a goal. And then in the second half, the real superstar on the Australian team, Sam Kerr, had a smashing goal to equalize it. It was 1-1. We were around a bunch of Australian fans. They went totally nuts. Then England took it 2-1 and in the 87th minute 3-1 they just couldn't get it back Australia was trying everything but they will now be in their first ever final against Spain on Sunday here and look guys what's exciting about this World Cup is there will be a first time winner that's what it's all about so even though Australia didn't win they obviously captured the hearts of their nation I mean talk about the mark they've left on this tournament and on their country yeah, captured the hearts. I think the Matildas are lodged deeply into every Australian's heart at this point. It's been extraordinary to watch just in the last couple of weeks. Look, this is a sport-obsessed nation, but usually with rugby or AFL, not with a women's team and not with soccer. I do just want to play a little bit of sound uh, from a couple girls we spoke with right after the loss tonight, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about what we heard tonight on the back end. I went to one of their games when I was like four years old, and I was so amazed by them. That's awesome. For years. What do you think? What kind of message does it send to you guys, to the young women and young girls of this country? It's like just even if you don't win, at least you've made it this far and it's like good that like keep trying. Yeah. Yeah, even if you give up or like 
even if you stop trying, you should like never give up and you should just keep going all the time. And the girls did so good out there today. Now, we met a lot of little girls I think we'll be seeing in kind of the 2030, 2040 World Cup. But what was amazing is we went around and talked to Australian fans after the loss tonight, and everyone said what the Matildas did is here to stay. We spoke with a big group of kind of young college-age boys who were all wearing Matildas jerseys. I said, have you ever cheered for a women's team? They said no, but they said this is really kind of the new normal. You guys, the Matildas and Sam Kerr and all of those players have changed this country, and it's been a real privilege to witness. Oh, so cool. And so, I mean, those girls so articulate they took real real messages to heart from that even if you make it here you keep trying I love that um, Molly so you mentioned this that both of the teams that are going to be in the final it's their first time making an appearance in the final tell us what what you're expecting who's your money on between England and Spain Ooh. Gosh, guys, hard. Look, Spain is one of the youngest teams in this tournament. They looked really good. Of course, you know, despite my yellow colors tonight, despite me cheering for the Matildas, of course, I live in London, so I do have some loyalty to the Lionesses. The Lionesses just look really good. They have made it to two previous semifinals. They've never made it to the final. So maybe this is their year, but absolutely, it will be a must-watch, must-tune-in game uh, on Sunday uh, against two real European powerhouses, guys. Mm, Molly, I, yeah, I didn't even think about that. How you live in England, and there you are, <laughs> wearing Australian colors. What's going on? <laughs> it's Exactly. So it's, suddenly she'll be wearing the different colors. I got Sunday. swept we'll up like, in Matilda Mania, guys. <laughs> Matilda Mania. <laughs> We've seen that happen a time or two, Molly, since you've been there. But it makes for the best TV when you get swept up. <laughs> we love it. And yeah. now we have something to look forward to on Sunday. Enjoy yes, the final. There you go. Even if it's not Team USA, I love that it's two first-time teams. Yeah. That gives you something Still to Still cool celebrate. to see. Molly, Thank you so much. Have fun. It's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.